the problem that ATLAS has done today is the security of the whole encryption. We all know that if a block cipher E has CNAT space, then it is vulnerable to a naive key recovery attack of similar space time. A plausible way to increase the effective key length without tampering the desired block cipher is to use the double encryption construction. security substantially if we look at a broader angle. So let me first recall the conventional CCA notion that we use to measure the security of double encryption before I explain what broader angles that we'd like to look at. So here's the CCA security notion for block cipher pi that is built on top of an ideal cipher E. Under this notion, an adversary is dropped into either a real world or an ideal world. In the real world, the oracles implement the construction pi and its inverse under a random secret key. In the ideal world, they instead implement an ideal random uh, permutation app and its inverse. In both worlds, the adversary has access to the ideal cipher E and its inverse, and the goal of the adversary is to guess which word it is in. The notion that we've seen, however, consider only the security of just a single user. In practice, an adversary typically attacks en masse, adaptively distributing its resources across multiple users. The adversary doesn't target any specific users. It is happy as long as it can compromise somebody. To model the multi-user security, in the real world, the oracles implement infinitely many instances of the construction pi, but all are built on top of the same ideal cipher E. Likewise, in the ideal world, they implement many uh, random permutations, F1, F2. The mu security can be implicitly obtained from the single user setting by a hybrid argument. But now, security degrades proportionally to the number of users. This artificial declaration, however, can be pretty loose in some setting. So recall that according to the conventional wisdom, Double encryption is useless. But that's because we look at just the single user perspective. So I argue that if we instead consider multi-user security, then double encryption does improve security substantially. In particular, AES has only 64-bit security in a MU setting due to a key collision attack. Under this attack, the adversary first chooses random keys K1, K2, and then encrypt some designated messages under those keys. It then uses the encryption oracle to encrypt the messages under many users' keys. If some of the adversary's chosen keys is also some user's key, then the adversary can realize that by checking for matching entries between the two tables, and then recovers that user's key. In contrast, double encryption provides a good way to preserve security in a multi-user setting. In particular, double encryption RDS has nearly 120 bits of mu security. There's, so far, there has been no prior work on analyzing the mu security of double encryption 
except the naive vow uh, by the hybrid argument. Why this is already enough to show that double encryption is quite better than single encryption, it is way weaker than what double encryption can potentially offer. The goal of our work is to achieve this dream bell. While we focus on double encryption, the scope of our work is much broader. We actually provide a generic technique for bounding information theoretic mu security. Our method can handle many types of constructions, such as authenticated encryption, PIF, or block cipher, and many types of ideal primitives, such as random oracle, ideal permutation, or ideal cipher. As long as the security notion is an indistinguishability game, we then showcase the new method by double encryption. The advantage formula is somewhat complex, but if the block length n is greater than the key length k, then we essentially achieve the rim bound. So here's the visualization that, uh, for the bounds that you've just seen. So the hybrid argument tells us that double encryption has about 80 bits of mu security, but double encryption is actually much stronger, providing about 115 bits of mu security. Thus, there's a huge gap between the security of double, double encryption and that of single encryption. Our proof technique, which we call almost proximity, is very general, as I mentioned earlier. But because of that, it can be overly complex in some setting. We therefore provide a simplified framework of our technique that is more restricted in scope, but hopefully improves the usability substantially. This simplified treatment can handle many real-world settings, such as the Galois counter mode, but unfortunately, it doesn't work well with double encryption. We therefore provide another specialized treatment of our technique that is tailored to the specific setting of double encryption. This specialization can be viewed as a generalization of our point-wise proximity technique in crypto last year. So let me now introduce the simplified framework. So under this setting, one wants to bow the distinguishing advantage of two randomized systems, S0 and S1. Here, S1 is the real system implementing many instances of a construction pi that is built on top of an ideal primitive. S0 is the ideal system implementing many functions fi that are sampled from some prior distribution independent of each other and independent of the ideal primitive. In each system, uh, they provide uh, two, uh, uh, access to two oracles, one for construction query and the other for primitive queries. In the context of double encryption, the first oracle is used to encrypt and decrypt via double encryption, and the second oracle uh, provides access to the ideal cipher. The arguments for the queries can further encode some information to, to specify, say, whether it is an encryption query or a decryption one. We, we use the following matrix to account for the cost of the adversary. The number of P of construction queries, the, sorry, the number of Q of construction queries, the number of P of primitive queries, and the generic data complexity sigma on construction queries. You might think of sigma as the total length of construction queries, but it's much more general than that. And we assume that if you make Q construction queries of complexity sigma, internally, these invoke at most sigma t primitive queries. When the adversary interacts with the two systems, its queries and answer are recorded in a transcript tau. So the advantage of the adversary is at most the statistical distance between the distributions of the transcripts that the two systems produced. <coughs> to bound this statistical distance, we classify the single user transcripts into good and bad ones. 
This classification, however, involves only construction queries. That is, if two transcripts have the same construction queries and answers, then either both of them are good or both of them are bad. Based on that, we then classify the mute transcript into nice and not nice ones. A mute transcript is nice if for any user, the corresponding induced, trans still trans induced still transcript for that user is also good. After classification, we then bound the probability that one can encounter a not nice transcript in the ideal world. These are uh, the analysis in a multi-user setting. But because we are in the ideal world, the analyses are often simple. Now, note that the statistical distance is a sum of some products. If we plot some rectangles whose widths are the first term in the product and the heights are the second term in the product, then the statistical distance is the area of those rectangles. Here, the green area corresponds to not nice transcripts, and the blue area corresponds to nice ones. The bar that we just obtained allows us to replace the green area by the orange rectangle. We now only need to bar the blue area by using some single-user quantities. In order to achieve that, we consider an arbitrary good seal transcript tau and then establish a bound on the probabilities of real and of, on the ideal and real probabilities. It is exactly what one would do to achieve the, seal, the single user bound by the edge coefficient technique. We then factor out the bound into two terms, epsilon and epsilon prime. The first one must be a super additive function, meaning that epsilon must satisfy this technical inequality. Many co uh, common advantage formulas, such as q squared plus sigma squared over 2 to the n, are super additive. Having obtained some single-user quantities, we now need to translate them into multi-user settings. For simplicity, let's start with a non-adaptive adversary A, meaning that the adversary has to fix the way it distributes the resources at the very beginning. So suppose that the adversary makes QI construction queries of complexity sigma i on user i, and assume that for any single user adversary B, its advantage is at most epsilon plus epsilon prime. Then by using a hybrid argument, the advantage of A is at most the sum in which x sum n is epsilon plus epsilon prime. The, the first argument of this function, however, is P plus sigma t instead of just p, because during the hybrid arguments, we have to simulate some construction queries, and these involves making primitive queries. When we sum it up over all users, because epsilon is super additive, and they are at most q users, the sum is at most epsilon plus q epsilon prime. The argument that we've just seen, however, only works for a non-adaptive adversary. The main issue in multi-user setting is that the adversary can adaptively distribute the resources. To deal with that, we instead do a hybrid argument at the transcript level because everything is fixed there. But this in turn requires the single user bow at the transcript level as well. However, that is exactly what we got when we bow the ratio of the real and ideal probabilities. Now recall that if the adversary is non-adaptive, then you can bow the blue area by epsilon plus sq epsilon prime. 
for our adaptive adversaries, if you use the hybrid element at the transcript level, you can obtain the same, essentially the same bound, but now there's an extra multiplicative factor too, which is probably the artifact of our technique. The framework that you just seen, however, doesn't work with double encryption. We therefore provide another specialized framework of our uh, technique to deal with that. Our goal is to obtain the mu bow, but only using sealed quantities. To achieve that, again, we classify the sealed transcripts into good and bad ones. But this time, there's no restriction on the classification, meaning that it can involve primitive queries. And again, we bow the probability that one can encounter a bad steel transcript in the ideal world. Having done so, we now can reach and focus on good steel transcripts and again establish a bow on the ratio of real and ideal probabilities. We then factor these into three terms. The last involve a transcript dependent quantities, collision tau. We have an intuition what this means. Consider this specific transcript. Here, if you make a construction query to encrypt X, you get a string Y. We therefore draw a blue arrow from X to Y. Likewise, if you make a primitive query to encrypt, to, to decipher U based on the key K1, you get a string answer V. We correspondingly draw a red arrow from U to V. And collision tau is simply the number of red arrows in which one of the two endpoints is hit by another blue arrow. We now need to translate it, those few quantities into the mu setting by using a hybrid argument at a transcript level as before. Under this translation, again, epsilon has blown up two thanks to its super additivity, and epsilon prime and epsilon stars both have blow up 2q. Do you have an intuition for the blow up of the last term? Note that for a mute transcript obtained in the ideal world, it's very unlikely that a red arrow is hit by too many blue ones. The surface threshold here is obtained by a bonds into beans analysis. And the blow up is essentially twice that threshold. And here's the direct theorem to move the seal conditions to the mu setting, the term 2 to the minus n is the probability that uh, some red arrow is hit by too many uh, blue ones. We now apply our technique into a setting of double encryption. So let's consider an arbitrary seal transcript. Let's now extend that with the keys J1, J2. In the real world, these are the actual keys of double encryption reviewed at the end when the adversary finishes querying. In the ideal world, these are random strings independent of anything else. If uh, the graphical representation of the extended transcript contains some part that we call chains, as highlighted here, it is trivial to distinguish. It's therefore important to bow the probability that you have changed when you extend the transcript tau in the ideal world. But if the bound will be inferior if we have too many red arrows hitting the same point. For example, here you have six red arrows, but there are nine paths leading to nine possible chains. So to deal with that, we define a seal transcript to be bad if it has B or more red arrows hitting the same point, and the threshold is selected so that the probability of having a bad transcript is very small. And you can then obtain a bound on the ratio of real and ideal probabilities. So summing up, today we propose almost proximity, a very powerful technique in handling multi-user bounds. When you apply that, uh, to the setting of double encryption, one can realize that double encryption does improve mu security substantially. The bow is tight if the block length is greater than the key length, but 
where for the particular case that the block length is very small compared to the key length, we cannot find a matching attack, and thus leave it as an open problem. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>